Bhavavatu Sahanao Bhunaktu Sahavirya Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastu Mavid Vishadahai Aum Shanti 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 Namaste. <laughs> so I guess I flummoxed everybody with that last video about superimposition and Vedanta Sutra and all that stuff. You should watch it anyway because uh, then you'll understand what I'm talking about. Uh, nobody's dared to comment on it. <laughs> I guess they didn't get it. Well, it represents about, I don't know, 30 or 40 hours of research uh, crammed into 23 minutes. <laughs> so, of course, it's very dense and it's also very high. And we use a lot of big words. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> The dictionary is your friend, use it. Um, so I'm gonna to try to explain that, I'm gonna to try to give you the Reader's Digest version. <laughs> As you can tell, I'm still blissed out by the whole thing. Uh, and the reason is, uh, a long time ago, back in 1990s, I had the insight that Spontaneous bhakti involves the creation of a unique personal relationship with God. In other words, in the scriptures and various commentaries and whatnot, there are all kinds of, you know, classic relationships with God. And most religious teachers, actually all the ones I've ever come in contact with, they pretty much say, well, you can only approach God in one of these ways. You're pretty much stuck. Uh, there's no real free choice in the matter. It's not up to you. And this is not supported by the Vedas. The Vedas give the opposite point of view. They say, well, just about anything that you decide is a symbol for God, for Brahman, Nirguna Brahman, is a valid uh, article of worship. So you can worship Brahman as Aung, or as the sun, or as prana, or as so many other things, the, the, uh, the space within the heart. I mean, there's dozens of different metaphors given in Vedanta Sutra and the Upanishads. So where do these guys get off saying there's only one way? You have to worship this God or that God or, you know, whoever, Indra or whatever. <laughs> and there's no other way. Well, these guys are trying to build an organization. They're trying to establish a career as a preacher. In other words, they're trying to make money. And making money always gets in the way of the truth. You know, just like politics and war and stuff like that, the first casualty is the truth. And the truth is, it's up to you to decide how you worship God. 
So for example, in my case, I was spontaneously attracted to Narasimha Dev. Narasimha is the half man, half lion form of Vishnu uh, revealed in the scriptures. But I was not uh, attracted to him <laughs> in the standard way given in the books because that's not how he revealed himself to me. He revealed himself internally, not through any books, not through any kind of uh, formal worship or anything like that, but he just showed up in my mind <laughs> in a very friendly way, a very intimate way, which I'm not going to go into detail, but let's just say it's different from the way he's presented in the scriptures. Huh? But according to Shankaracharya, that's all right. As long as the image or the form or the metaphor or the symbol that we worship as a representative of Brahman is grounded in the Vedic uh, sacrifices, is part of the paraphernalia or the articles of worship or the procedure of worship used in the Vedic rituals, then it's connected with the Vedas and it has the potency of the Vedas. And of course, that potency, as we've gone over numerous times, is revealed by Mahavishnu to Lord Brahma in the beginning of the creation. And that's where that potency comes from. And it is handed down from generation to generation, from guru to disciple, since the beginning of the universe. So if you have some other theory about how the Vedas came to be, what you're doing is you're, you're cutting off the branch you're sitting on. You're, you're disempowering yourself by making some anthropomorphic theory that, you know, some guy uh, a long time ago accidentally realized Brahman uh, and then wrote it down or something like that. Well, how did he even get the idea of Brahman? It has to come from someplace. And since Brahman has no qualities, no actions, no change, no form, it's invisible, it's always subjective, and so on. How is anybody going to guess that it even exists? Well, I suppose you could say it's within Brahman's power to spontaneously uh, reveal itself to someone. But there's a problem with this. We know from our deep study of ontology, which we did in the beginning of this uh, whole channel, that if a person does not have a concept in their mind of a particular experience, that experience can happen to them and they'll miss it completely. I'll give you a good example. Turiya. Turiya is the fourth state of consciousness. It's transcendental consciousness. And it's also the root of all the other three states, meaning waking consciousness, dream consciousness, and deep sleep. So Turiya is a special state of consciousness because the, its object is, or are, the other three states of consciousness. In other words, because of Turiya, we can distinguish whether we're, we're in waking, dreaming, or deep sleep consciousness. That means Turiya is active all the time. We are all the time in Turiya. 
And yet, because of our identification, especially with waking and dreaming consciousness, we would never know it unless the scriptures or a guru or teacher reveals it to us. Isn't it? So what to speak of Brahman? Brahman is even more subtle and has even less uh, concepti conceptual attributes. Actually, it has no conceptual attributes at all. So the only way we can know Brahman, if Brahman reveals itself. How does Brahman reveal itself? To Lord Brahma at the beginning of creation through the breathing of Mahavishnu. And then Brahma passes it down to his sons and disciples and it comes down to us through the parampara, the disciplic succession going back to the very beginning. So if our process of self-realization is connected with this parampara, it has potency to reveal Brahman to us. Of course, in the ordinary state of consciousness, we don't know Brahman. We can't know Brahman because we're identified with the body, the mind, different things that happen, other people, relationships, karma, on and on and on. So how do we get free from that? So the Vedas say, all right, you can't just jump. Huh? And this is why teachings that only talk about uh, Nirguna Brahman cannot give you enlightenment. For example, uh, Krishnamurti, J. Krishnamurti. He talked about beyond knowledge. And, and it's true. Brahman is beyond knowledge. So if his talking was actually in line with the Vedas, it would have potency to give enlightenment. But in his whole long life, Jiddu Krishnamurti's disciples never became enlightened. Why? Because he wasn't following the Vedas. He wasn't giving the step-by-step, -step, easy, gradual transition from conditioned consciousness to unconditioned consciousness. But the Vedas do. Right at the beginning of the Rig Veda, they give these sacrifices to Indra. And then later on in the Upanishads portion, it's revealed that Indra is just a symbol for Brahman. And Shankaracharya brings that out in his commentary. So in other words, it doesn't matter what form of, or name of God or what aspect of God or what kind of relationship with God you worship in your sadhana or your meditation. What matters is that it's rooted in the concepts of the revelations of the original Veda, which is a gradual approach to uh, the ultimate. Because no one can just jump up. It's not possible. It's never been possible. It can't work. It doesn't work. So that's why you should follow the gradual process and it's up to you to choose which of the many symbols by which you approach the ultimate truth aung tat sat aung shakti aung